Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from our website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number six in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, March the 8th. First, I'll be talking to Brooklyn-based Real Estential CEO, Isaac Wolf, who is a leader in the fashion industry and who is committed to producing environmentally friendly and ethically sourced clothing that helps people look and feel their best at an affordable cost. And I'll be talking to economist Saul Leslake about the latest inflation figures. But first, let's talk to Isaac Wolf. Well, Isaac, what inspired you to start Real Essentials and what is the brand's vision in the clothing industry? So what inspired me to start Real Essentials? In 2015, I was working by a company. I was running a division for them. And uh, I realized there was pretty much time for me to go out on my own. And I wanted to really tap into the online space. I know Amazon just, they really started picking up steam back in 2015. And I wanted to tap into online space. So I decided to really get into the closeout world. Uh, I started buying deals here and there in different categories, food, uh, beauty, clothing. I wanted to learn the business, but not by building a brand. Learn it before we started that. See what works, gain some more knowledge. And we really tapped into the clothing market. It really stuck with us. And uh, that's really where we, we decided to move forward with. The clothing stuck with us. It worked out well, and we built a business on it. It's fascinating that you're on Amazon, which means anyone can get it anywhere, even in Australia. Now, the online clothing market is highly competitive. How do you actually differentiate yourself from the other brands on Amazon? Because Amazon's packed with other brands. Yeah, so we were, the truth is, in 2017, when we started Real Essentials, we were the first ones to really come to market with offering more than one piece to a customer. You know, we, we, we came up with the concept of bundling product together in clothing. It was introduced in other categories, really wasn't in, in the market on, a, uh, on, a, on a, a, a nice scale in the clothing industry. So that, that's really what we built our business on. We, we, anything that a customer wanted one, more than one piece of, we decided to bundle it up. So t-shirts, it's a volume item. Instead of selling one piece, we decided to sell five of them. Um, and that was really one of the big areas that differentiated us in the market uh, at that time when we started our business. So what if someone wanted T-shirt and uh, pants, for example? You could bundle so that up too? Yeah, so we don't, we don't offer those type of bundles right now. I would call that more of a collection or, or a set, but we sell an item in multiples, in bundles. That allows you to contribute to the brand success on the Amazon platform? Yeah, it definitely does. It it, it allows us to offer a, uh, a stronger value to the customer without jeopardizing on the quality of the product. So uh, it's something that stuck with us and we went all in with it for the past six years and we've had success with it. Now, uh, sustainability is becoming increasingly important to consumers. Do you make any sustainability items? So we know, looking at it, it's something that we definitely want to jump in into. But at the time right now, we don't offer anything sustainable in our in our life. You, you offer inclusive sizing options? We do, yes. So can you talk about the brand's commitment to diversity and why it's essential to cater customs to all customers for all body types? Uh, sure. Online's a different market than retail. Uh, it's a safe space. It's a spot that uh, you can do it on your own. And uh, we want to cater to all sizes, all genders. Uh, that's the online world. Now, in the online market, it's very much geared around customer feedback. How, how do you bring, build that into the dis brand's decision-making process? So feedback for us is a very, obviously online, it's a very important area of the business. So we listen to the customer very, very closely. And we have teams that are dedicated for this, just watching what the customer is saying. And we constantly improve our product based on their feedback. So if we hear that the customers aren't liking the quality of the product or the weight of the product, or the feel of the product. We go back to our development and production teams and we sit down, we align and we make improvements to the product 
to make sure that we're always offering the best product uh, to the customer. How often do you get that feedback? Every single day. It just rolls in all day long. So it's such an important area of our business. We really built out data visualization sets to understand what the customer is saying on a very in-depth basis. So it's, it's an area that we focus in on. It's an area that we're looking at every single day. We have teams dedicated for it. The customer is what our business is built on. So we have to cater to them. So you would have teams working very furiously on the, all the data analytics? All day long. All day long, yes. Are there any notable instances where customer feedback has influenced product design or brand strategy? So it's mostly fit and quality, right? That's what the feedback is that we can use in order to go ahead and improve a product. So yeah, we focus in on it. We see, we, 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 we review what the customer is saying in regards to the quality and the fit. And we constantly look to improve the product and we use that to really grow our business and expand our business in different areas as well. Now, given the state of uh, well, the economy, uh, how do you maintain consistent quality standards while offering affordable products? It starts with your relationships with your factories. Having the right relationships with your factories is number one. And then to top that, we have our own quality control and quality assurance teams overseas that are watching over our production and our quality on a day-to-day. Can you elaborate on that approach? Uh, when you when you focus, do that while focusing on the basics and putting it all into bundles? Yeah, sure. So our business, when we started it, was built on the the core principle, not the, but one of them, that we wanted to offer quality basics at an affordable price. So how do we accomplish this without jeopardizing the quality? It's really offering a higher price point to the customer, which is bundles, right? And we offer them the best value possible by bundling our product up. And by doing this, we don't, we don't jeopardize on quality. I mean, we're in the value side of this world, of the clothing business. It's volume, it's value. And we don't want to offer value at a lower quality. So what we were able to accomplish was bundling product together so that we wouldn't have to jeopardize on the quality of the product. Just getting back to the question of you on Amazon. I mean, how does Real Essential optimize the online shopping experience for its customers? So we want to make it easy to shop. So whenever a customer comes to one of our product pages or our website, you want to start with making sure that it's easy to, e- easy to shop. Marketing is top of mind as well. We have, we have very strong marketing teams that are making sure that we're getting the product in front of the customer and just making sure that we're always available. We're always there and in stock inventory. You know, it's, it's an uncomfortable feeling that when you want to buy something and a customer comes to shop and they can't, they can't buy it because you're out of inventory. So inventory as well. So those elements uh, are key areas that we make sure we focus in on. Now, uh, sort of, uh, I sort of grew up in the clothing industry. So so my family came from there. And I was struck by how you actually have to stay up to date with seasonal collections. I mean, how do you ensure that your brand stays up to date with the latest clothing outlooks while maintaining a timeless appeal? So again, we stick to basics. Basics is a very big industry. So staying up to date of seasonal products for us isn't as difficult because we're not in the fashion world. We're not a fashion business. We're a basics business. Uh, We offer basic fashion, but it's a different market that we're in than uh, the, the fashion business. Where do you see Real Essentials in five years' time? What's your vision for the future? We want to be a household name. We want to be a household name in five years. Uh, we want brands to, we want customers to recognize us as a household brand. That's where we'd like to be in five years from now. But uh, being on Amazon, do you have those aspirations globally? So Amazon offers global opportunities. Um, and outside of that, we're looking into brick and mortar. We're looking into retail stores, physical stores. We're working on something big that would potentially get us onto TV as well. We're really dedicated to building real essentials, not just from a, overall top line revenue standpoint, but we're, we're, we're dedicated to building this as a, as a real true household brand. Right. So you'd be moving into physical stores as well. We're planning on it. We're hoping to, 
So that's in the that's in our plans over the next five years. Right. Okay. So in five years' time, we can expect to see Real Essentials opening stores in Brooklyn. I'm not so sure if we'll have one in in Australia in five years, uh, but potentially a few areas over the uh, the U.S. Okay. Well, Isaac, it's been terrific talking to you, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Leah. Nice meeting you. Take care. Have a great day. Thank- and now let's talk to economist Saul Eslake. Well, Saul, what's your take on the inflation figures? Well, the most recent figures show headline inflation steady at 3.4% over the year to January, unchanged from December. Underlying inflation's running a bit higher than that. And services inflation, which is what the Reserve Bank is most focused on, on in part because it's primarily caused by domestic factors, as opposed to the goods price inflation, which we saw early on when inflation was first rising, which largely reflects global factors. So my take on these numbers is, as it was after the December figures, that inflation is definitely heading in the right direction, that is to say, down, uh, but it's not a linear path. And there's still some way to go before the Reserve Bank can be sufficiently confident that inflation will be back within its 2 to 3% target band within a reasonable time for it to even be thinking about cutting interest rates, let alone actually doing it. Well, wages are rising at about 4.2%, and surely that would have an impact on inflation. Well, it will do if productivity growth, which has been negative over the last 18 months, doesn't return to its longer term average of about 2% per annum. So far in Australia, wages haven't been a significant factor in the rise in inflation we've experienced. That's different from the US and the UK and New Zealand, where wage increases have been much bigger than they have been in Australia and where they have clearly been a factor in the inflation that those countries have experienced. And in some ways, the fact that workers are now getting wage increases that are faster than increases in prices is a good thing, in part because it will help to cushion the economy against the risks of a recession arising from interest rates being at relatively high levels for an extended period. But if productivity growth remains negative, or indeed even if it returns to a barely positive level, then wage inflation could become a contributor to higher than expected service price inflation for longer than the Reserve Bank is willing to tolerate, in which case it could serve as an obstacle to interest rates coming down as soon as the financial markets and others expect. Productivity levels would have to rise to 2% at the moment? Not in the next quarter or so, but over the next 12 to 24 months, yes, if four to four and a half percent wage inflation is to be consistent with about two and a half percent price inflation, then productivity growth has to be about two. Otherwise, the arithmetic doesn't stack up. Okay. Would immigration have something to do with that? Could immigration help? No, I don't think it. I don't think it does. The causes of the slowdown in Australia's productivity growth are complex and contested. Uh, among other things, something odd is happening to productivity in the mining sector, which has dropped by twenty percent since the end of twenty nineteen, and that matters because mining is ten percent of Australia's economy, and it is by far the highest productivity industry in the economy because it's so capital intensive. If you take mining out, then productivity growth over the past year has actually been slightly positive. Another factor contributing to the slowdown in productivity growth has been the gradual shift in employment towards intrinsically low productivity industries like health and aged care. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's clearly in line with community preferences that more be spent on health and aged care. And a lot of the output of the health and aged care sectors is in fact not paid by consumers, but rather by governments in the form of taxes, so it doesn't get into the consumer price index. But there have been slowdowns in productivity in other parts of the economy as well, and they appear to be due to what economists call a loss of economic dynamism in the economy. That is that there is actually less mobility between firms of workers and capital, uh, businesses that might otherwise have gone out of business 
and thus freed up the labor and capital they're using to be deployed in more productive uses, haven't gone out of business in part because interest rates have been so low and partly because government policies have been propping up otherwise unproductive small businesses simply because they're small businesses. And governments of both political persuasions seem increasingly susceptible to what I call small business fetishism. That is the idea that there's something inherently more noble about running a small business than working for a big one or a government agency or a not-for-profit. And therefore, small business people should pay less tax on a given amount of income than people earning the same income in the form of wages and salaries. You know, both sides of politics seem to subscribe to that point of view, but I think it's making a contribution to our poor productivity performance because the data shows that productivity in small businesses is about 20% below the average for all businesses. And despite the commonly made claim that small business is the so-called engine room of the economy, the reality is that small business has in aggregate been shedding jobs over the last 15 years and almost all of the employment that's been created in Australia over the last decade, over the last 15 years, has been created at medium-sized or larger businesses. Now, in terms of the RBA, Michelle Bullock in her first press conference said the problem with inflation now is it's got a four in front of it which would suggest to me that you would have to get down to the low threes before we see an interest rate cut. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would, Leon. I mean, the Reserve Bank isn't going to wait until inflation is below 3% to start cutting interest rates, but they do want to be much more confident that it's going to be less than 3% in a reasonable period of time in order to begin cutting interest rates. Uh, and they're not that confident now, and with good reason. I mean, although people are very aware that the Reserve Bank of Australia has put interest rates up, up a lot, you know, 13 times, by a total of four and a quarter percentage points since they began doing that later than almost any three other central bank in the world in May 2022. But let's put that into some perspective. The cash rate here of 4.35%, is lower than 4.5% in the Eurozone, lower than 5% in the UK and Canada, lower than 5.38% in the United States, and lower than 5.5% in New Zealand. And in all of those other countries where the central banks have been more aggressive than the Reserve Bank has been, inflation has been coming down faster than in Australia. For example, just the night before we recorded this interview, the US reported that the Federal Reserve's favoured measure of inflation rose by 2.4% over the year to January. That's a percentage point below our inflation rate, as reported by the ABS on Wednesday. So I think the Reserve Bank has consciously decided, although they haven't said so explicitly, to tolerate inflation being above its target for a longer period than those other central banks I mentioned are willing to tolerate inflation being above their targets in order to preserve as much as they can of the gains that have been made in recent years in reducing unemployment and underemployment. And I'm not criticising the Reserve Bank in saying that. It's a recognition of the fact that unlike some other central banks, they actually have a dual mandate not only to keep inflation between 2 and 3%, but also to promote the achievement of full employment. But it follows from that, that if the Reserve Bank's willing to tolerate inflation being above its target for longer than its peer central banks are, that the Reserve Bank will be slower to start bringing interest rates down than its peer central banks are going to be. I mean, I think it's highly likely that the US Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, and maybe even the Reserve Bank of New Zealand will start cutting interest rates this year. But bearing in mind that not only is Australia's inflation rate coming down less quickly than in those other countries, because it hasn't tightened monetary policy as much, but also that Australian households are going to get on the 1st of July income tax cuts that are equivalent in terms of the impact on aggregate cash flows of two 25 basis point reductions in the Reserve Bank's official cash rate. Now, granted, they are distributed differently from the way that cuts in interest rates would be. They affect different groups of households. But in aggregate, the impact of the tax cuts is the same as two 25 basis point reductions in the Reserve Bank's official interest rate. 
So why would the Reserve Bank be doubling up on that by cutting its interest rate at the same time? I don't think they will. I don't think the Reserve Bank will start cutting Australian interest rates until, say, February next year, unless they and I are horribly wrong about how quickly inflation will fall this year. So February next year, we can expect a rate cut. That would be my pick at this stage based in part on what the Reserve Bank is itself expecting the course of inflation to be over the traje- over the course of this year. Well, Saul, thank you very much for your time. Oh, that's a pleasure, as always. So what's happening in the news? Well, China set its annual growth target at around 5%, an ambitious goal that will put pressure on the nation's top leaders to unleash more stimulus as they try to lift confidence in an economy hampered by a property sum and entrenched deflation. Premier Li Jun acknowledged the challenges facing the world's second largest economy as he delivers his first work report to the national parliament at its opening on Tuesday. It is not easy for us to realise these targets, he told thousands of delegates assembled at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. We need policy support and joint efforts from all fronts. Gross domestic product not target met economists' expectations for Beijing to repeat last year's goal but will be harder to achieve due to a higher base of comparison in 2024. Analysts in a separate Bloomberg survey forecast the economy would likely expand by 4.6% this year, underscoring the challenges facing policymakers as they try to resist big stimulus. The around 5% target is probably intended to boost confidence, but the specific measures unveiled may have limited impact on lifting sentiment, said Jacqueline Rong. Chief China Economist at BNP Paribas SA. We think it is not easy to achieve the growth target, she added, noting the bank is holding its forecast for this year at 4.5%. China's most high-profile annual meeting comes as President Xi Jinping tries to restore faith in an economy grappling with a prolonged real estate crisis, dwindling domestic demand and headwinds from its geopolitical rivalry with the US. Investors have called for strong action as foreign executives continue to recoil from the world's second-largest economy. Rocked by a series of money laundering scandals, Australia's casinos are looking beyond hardcore gaming to a safer bet. Tourists. Just a few years ago, the $5.5 billion industry, which is dominated by Crown and Star Entertainment, was riding high on profits fattened by high rollers flown in from Asia by so-called junket operators. Those junket operators are now banned from most casinos following concerns about the rise of money laundering. As those junket operators shift online, Casinos find they not only have a revenue hole, but hundreds of hotel rooms to fill in gleaming properties, including stars soon to open $3 billion Queen's Wharf in Brisbane and Crown Swish new $2.4 billion Barangaroo Casino in Sydney. Ibis World says the Australian casino sector has faced a period of unprecedented crises since the pandemic, with a spate of government inquiries endangering the licences of the largest operators in the industry. Revenue has fallen 4.1% over the past five years. Announcing a drop in half-yearly profit this week, Star Entertainment CEO Robbie Cook underscored how much the gambling world had changed when he said the group was limiting the time guests spent on gaming tables, as well as suspending the serving of complimentary drinks in its private gaming rooms as part of new controls. Such changes were already hitting the bottom line, with revenue from gaming tables slipping 20.9% during the first half, while takings from electronic gaming machines were down 5.9%. Australian casinos are not alone in being forced to diversify income from the traditional gaming cash cow. In Macau, casinos have given an undertaking to the government to invest US $15 billion, that's $23 billion Aussie, in the coming decade, of which 90% must be spent on non-gaming ventures. Casinos are increasingly downplaying their gaming areas in marketing materials, while restaurants, shopping and theatre visits for tourists are highlighted. The Queen's Wharf website does not even mention its casino, concentrating instead on four new luxury hotels, a myriad of new restaurants, bars and entertainment experiences, luxury retail and a state-of-the-art event centre. And Australia's insurance sector should be subject to a very public inquiry from the competition regulator to examine breakneck price rises, according to former competition star Alan Fells, with current chair Gina Cascotlieb noting she shared broader concerns around affordability. Speaking after a trio of insurers unveiled a combined $1.3 billion in profits from Australian customers in the February results season, Professor Fell said he was concerned about competition in the insurance sector, which has moved to rapidly ratchet up prices in recent years. This comes as the Australian Competition Consumer Commission runs a ruler over insurance pricing in Northern Australia and a parliamentary inquiry and considers the industry's responses to the 2022 floods. Professor Fell said he'd been flooded by complaints from ordinary people 
about the price of their insurance. ACCC Chair Gina Cascotlieb said the regulator shares concerns broadly around insurance pricing and affordability, but said it was a matter for the government to trigger a targeted price inquiry. Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones said the government was keenly aware of affordability issues, noting a parliamentary inquiry would examine pricing. Mr Jones said he was not arguing against Mr Fell's proposals, but noted any policy responses to pricing would be a matter for an inquiry. Insurance Australia Group, which represents such brands as NRMA, RACV and CGU, reported a 12.5% overall lift in its gross written premium in six months to December 2023. IAG, which reported a $1,614 million profit from its Australian direct and intermediated insurance arms, has registered up premiums on customers as a response to several years of poor weather and unexpected inflation. Gross written premiums, or the total insurance premium increases plus new business charged by IAG, has climbed from $5.9 billion three years ago to $7.9 billion, largely driven by price rises. IAG is also flagging further pain as the insurer pushes to lift its overall margin to 15% from its current 13.7%. Levels And in keeping with this, Australia's cost of living crisis appears to be easing on fr- several fronts, but one key household expense continues to climb sharply and painfully, insurance. While food, fuel and mortgage rises have moderated, the price of protecting our homes, contents, cars and other assets is rising faster this financial year than it did in 2022-23. Australian Bureau of Statistics figures show overall insurance premiums increased 16% in calendar 2023, accelerating from their 14% rise in 2022-23 and four times higher than 2023's annual inflation rate of 4.1%. There were even heftier rises in several insurance categories. A report by the Actuaries Institute found median home insurance premiums surged 28% in 2023, while recent research by comparison website Mozo found car and travel insurance surged 24% last year. Insurance company IAG's profit rose from $167 million to $248 million for the half year to December 31. Suncor's cash profit jumped 14% to $660 million. Medibank's underlying net profit rose 16.3% to $263 million. And NIB's half-year profit surged 22% to $119 million. And Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones will this week take the first step to force Facebook owner Meta to pay media companies for content after the social media giant said it would not renew existing deals. The move comes after Google, the other tech giant, signed up to the news media bargain code Friday told Mr Jones that he intended to proceed with renegotiating deals with publishers. Meta's decision could cost local publishers about $70 million a year and in dozens of jobs once existing contracts expire later this year. Meta pulling out of its news contracts will deal a blow to media companies. Nine Entertainment, Seven West Media and News Corp will lose between 5 and 9% of their net profit each year if the deals don't continue. Brokers at Macquarie have estimated Mr Jones will ask companies such as Seven West Media, Nine Entertainment News Corp to hand over evidence to help build a case against the Silicon Valley Marbury National. The first step is to establish the existence of a significant bargaining power imbalance between Meta and local companies and that the platform is not making significant contribution to local news. That will allow Mr Jones to make Meta a designated platform and force it to the bargaining table. Mr Jones, who along with Communications Minister Michelle Rowland, is taking the lead implementing steps under the news media bargaining code, called Meta's actions a dereliction of its responsibility to Australia. Meta and Google in 2021 signed dozens of deals with media companies worth an estimated $250 million a year, uh, combined under the coalition legislated news media bargaining code. The, The money is paid for journalists, editors and photographers at dozens of publishers across the country. Run by founder and chief executive Mark Zuckerberg, Meta is worth not $1.9 trillion and owns Facebook and Instagram. It makes almost all of its money from advertising. Facebook reports cash flows from customers at $1.4 billion at locally to the corporate regulator, but the Australian Competition Consumer Commission recently pointed out it could make as much as $5 billion from Australians every year. The company has become increasingly hostile to governments looking to direct a portion of the social media giant's revenue towards local media content, insisting its users are not going to platforms to access news. And Cole's controversial deployment of some of the largest anti-theft technologies has clearly had an immediate impact. When supermarkets started introducing self-service checkouts, a rise in shoplifting was more than offset by the reduction in staffing. But a surge in theft attributing the cost of living pressures, Coles' loss ballooned by 20% in the last financial year. 
Loss is a term used by Coles to describe the financial impact of shoplifting and throwing away spoiled fresh food. Last Tuesday, it revealed that the basis point measure for theft, which had been at 70 to 80 at full year results, has been pulled back markedly to 50. Its digital revenue also performed well, with e commerce revenue up 29% on the previous corresponding period and 15% for its liquor sales. The most obvious of the new anti theft solutions was the installation of security gates at the exits of some stores to prevent shoppers walking out without paying for their items. It also included AI-enabled surveillance cameras that track customers around stores, skip scan monitoring to detect when items haven't been scanned at at the self-service checkout, and fog machines that fill stores with the smoke if they're broken into. SkipScan has been rolled out in 305 stores, and smart gates are in 267 coal supermarkets, with them being progressively deployed into the worst affected stores. A rush of news reports highlighting customers' horror about being locked in the store and being treated like suspected criminals greeted the deployment of the technology, but analysts say the financial results are worth more than a bit of initial angst. Coles' earnings were well received for reasons outside its digital effort. Of course, its supermarket's trade was up 4.9% in the first eight weeks of the year, which compared favourably with 1.5% for the year recorded by Woolworths. Some of this was attributable to price reductions on items like lamb and a Pokemon collectibles program that had children badgering parents to throw extra items into the trolley. Analysts and investors are starting to see the results of investment in digital initiatives in the warehouses and back office, with increased adoption of AI a trend all investors are looking for. A coal spokeswoman said AI had been integrated into several areas of the business to help improve operations and create more personalised shopping experiences. And the possibility of an ACCC investigation of the Big Four has emerged during an inquiry into the sector due to concerns that behaviour in the audit market resembles an oligopoly. The idea was first raised by EY, which submitted to the inquiry that the audit market is subject to intense competition and would welcome a specific inquiry from the ACCC that addresses any concerns that the committee may have. Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill asked representatives of the competition watchdog on Friday whether an investigation was warranted, given the significance of one of the four firms to benefit from the market concentration suggesting Tom Luna, ACCC General Manager of Mergers, said on the basis of the submissions made to the inquiry, it is clear that for big companies, the market does seem reasonably concentrated. The big four firms dominated the country's audit and assurance sector, responsible for 97% of external audits for ASX 300 companies, according to the ABC, and raking in billions every year while doing so. An ACCC investigation into the big four firms would enable the ACCC to use its broad information gathering powers, enlisting the help of data specialists and legal experts to interrogate the sector's competition for the first time. And the Australian Government will establish a $2 billion finance facility to help fund green energy and infrastructure investment in Southeast Asia to tap into spiralling demand for renewable power in the region between now and 2050. The initiative, a key recommendation by Business Luminary and Special Envoy to Southeast Asia, Nicholas Moore, will provide loans, guarantees, equity and insurance to help bolster what he found to be underweight and stagnant two-way trade and investment with the ASEAN bloc. It will be one of five of Mr Moore's recommendations to be adopted by the government and announced by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese at a CEO summit on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit in Melbourne on Tuesday. Mr Moore told the summit on Monday that Southeast Asia would need an estimated 454 gigawatts of a digital generation capacity between 2021 and 2050 in a transition that would employ more than 5 million people. The $2 billion Southeast Asia investment facil- financing facility will be managed by Export Finance Australia. The more than 100 company executives at the CEO Summit will include bankers Matt, Matt Komen and Shamara Wikramanaiki, Woodside's Meg O'Neill and Singtel's Wen Kwan Moon. Other recommendations to be adopted by the government are extended business validity visas from three to five years and extending the 10-year frequent traveller scheme to eligible ASEAN member states and Timor-Leste, establishing landing pads in Jakarta and Ho Chi Minh City to help Australian business boost technology services exports to Southeast Asian markets, appointing 10 business champions to strengthen t- trade and investment ties with each country in Southeast Asia, and a $140 million extension of the Partnerships for Infrastructure program. And dry conditions and soft international grain prices have led to Australia's ag- agricultural output declining by 15% this financial year, resulting in major reduction of finance farming incomes. The country's agricultural output is expected to drop to $80 billion in 2023-24 as crop production reduces by almost 20%, according to the Australian Bureau of Agricultural Resources, Economics and Sciences, ABARAS, March Commodities Report. 
The report also painted a grim picture for the nation's wine sector over coming years, warning the value of exports was forecast to fall by $83 million, or 6%, in 2023-24, and a further 3% in 2024-25. This is being driven by lower prices for Australian wine exports, which are already the lowest amongst major wine exporting countries, though the report said. If economic growth slows more than anticipated, the report warned Australian wine export value could, could drop another 23% by 2029. Domestic wine consumption has been falling over the past decade, which the report said was driven by health concerns and, more recently, the cost of living crisis. The Ibarra's report revealed a 14% drop in the value of agricultural exports, or $67 billion, after several buoyant years, driven by declining domestic production and softer international prices for most crops. And global developer Lindley's has been hit with a please explain notice by the Australian Securities Exchange after issuing a surprise earnings downgrade on its results last month. The company's shares plunged after it gave a tough view on its outlook, prompting major investors on its register to call for more urgency in turning the troubled company around. Lindley's fell to $136 million first half loss and shook investor confidence as it downgraded its outlook with activist investors Tanara Capital and HMC Capital pressing for more action. There are disappointing results cut against the grain of much of the property reporting season, and the stock fell by about 17% in the days after the results. In a blow to the company, the ASX queried the timing of the company's unexpected cut to its forecast, playing into criticism from dissident investors who argue Lendley's has structural problems and needs major restructuring and simplification. The company, led by managing director Tony Lombardo, revealed a downward revision to fiscal 2024 return on equity guidance from the lower end of its 8 to 10% range at 7%. We believe this to be the primary driver of the Lendley's security price decline, the company said. Lendley's insisted it first became aware of the information about its earnings prospects when preparing and finalising its financial results. It told the ASX board and a committee meeting started on February 14 and was scheduled to be completed on February 19. As late as December 18, Lendley's had publicly expected to maintain its earlier guidance for the financial year. And a leading health insurer has warned the embattled private hospital system faces rising at the same time as more patients opt for a day surgery over longer stays, reducing revenue. The industry's peak body warned of further hospital closures as losses mounted and 16 facilities have either announced plans to shut or had their declarations of private hospital revoked since 2022-23. If one part of the system fails, we all fail, NIB Chief Executive Mark Fitzgibbon said, adding there was no question that private hospitals had been hit hard by COVID-19. As Health Minister Mark Butler announced an average premium rise of 3.03% starting on April 1st, causing insurance stocks to rally, private hospital operators urged insurers to share more of their revenue. Mr Fitzgibbon said private hospitals had been hit by structural changes including more treatments provided through a day surgery rather than longer hospital stays and more care provided in what he called lower cost settings including in-home care. While the 3.03% increase in premiums will be the largest annual increase in private health costs since 2019, it was relatively modest by historical standards and less than the amount private health funds had initially pushed for. Medibank premiums will increase by 3.3%. Boopers will go up by 3.61%. HCF has been approved for a 2.89% rise, and NIB customers will incur a 4.1% price rise. Private insurers are allowed to increase their premiums once per year after receiving approval from the Federal Health Minister. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to Tim Rosanis, Managing Director of peer-to-peer car-sharing pioneer Turo, former head of growth for Uber Retail. He's well positioned to speak about the issue of the sharing economy as Aussies continue to battle changing economic conditions. And I'll be talking to Rabobank economist Michael Avery about the Chinese economy in the year of a dragon. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from our website, leongetler.com. If you like talking, please leave us a review with Apple Podcasts. Thank you in advance. In the meantime, you catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Wishing you all a safe and healthy week and looking forward to bringing Talking Business next week.